Be careful that in the times. It's great theater and it's great town. So it's always a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. So let me start by telling you why I'm concentrating on biblical stories on this tour. In some ways, it's not that much of a departure because I have woven religious stories through my teaching for 40 years. And religious stories from all over. I've, I really like the Tao Te Ching, the central Taoist text. I have a number of translations of that. And I think I know what most of it means, although texts like that are in some ways inexhaustibly dense, and so you never really get to the bottom of them, which makes them very interesting to contend with. I've studied ancient Mesopotamian mythology and Egyptian, and learned a lot from that. Fairy tales from all over, and different pop culture stories, and different ideologies, and and in doing that, I've been refining my understanding of those stories. So the more of them you know, then the more you investigate, the deeper the investigation you conduct into them, the more they link together and, and flesh each other out, the more you understand the narrative landscape. That's a good way of thinking about it. Now you might say, well, why bother with that? That's a very good question. The first thing you might want to notice is that you do bother with it, you see. And not only do you bother with it, but you, you'll pay for the privilege of bothering with it. And it's intrinsically engrossing and meaningful, entertaining. You, you, you pay for movies. You buy works of fiction. And we're foolish, modern people, because we think that that's entertainment. And what we don't understand is that Yes, it's an entertainer. Why is it entertaining? Is it just fun? Well, going to a horror movie isn't exactly fun, I wouldn't say. In fact, it's, it's a rather, on face, a rather perverse form of enjoyment because you might go to a horror movie and cover your eyes for like 20% of it. So why would you go pay for, to watch something that you don't want to see? You can imagine being dragged there, kicking and screaming, but would you line up to what? To be terrified? To be disgusted? Or maybe you're lining up to find out that you can tolerate being terrified and disgusted. And that's a much better way of thinking about it. Maybe you're there for practice. Now, I know people, there's a minority of people who go to horror movies for the perverse delight. But there's a minority of people who do everything for perverse delight, and so <laughs> more, more people than you might think, even <laughs> maybe even yourself to some degree. Uh, in any case, people do those sorts of things well, for deeply mysterious reasons. Mysterious reasons that are akin to, well, they're akin to the reasons you might go see a P Pinocchio, for example, or another Disney and Pinocchio. Pinocchio is a movie that I've spent a long time taking apart. I finally cracked the last part of it about two weeks ago. I could never figure out why Geppetto ends up in a whale. When you watch that, it just makes sense, but it makes no sense, mm -hmm. right? And any more than any of the rest of the movie makes sense. The movie's about a marionette who follows a cricket to find his father in a whale. He, he just swallowed out, no problem. So, of course. <laughs> It makes perfect sense. It doesn't make any sense at all. And neither does the fact that you, you perceive it as making sense. It says something very deep about you. It says that there are parts of you that are capable of understanding stories that are so deep that you have no possibility of articulate, articulating their meanings. Uh, I, can, I can tell you, I'll tell you, because it's fun, I'll tell you why Geppetto ends up at will. So, it has to do with the idea of the death of God. 
It's complicated, but I hope I can get it right because I've just figured it out. I'll, I'll give you an example. I had a student, now he's now a, an employee of mine. He's working on a large language model development and has been for about 10 years. He was a very early expert in this area. And one of the things he's used the large language models to do is to map out the concept of God. Now, what a large language model model does is it models the statistical relationship between words, words and phrases, phrases and phrases, sentences and sentences. It maps out the map of meaning. That's what a large language model does. It produces a map of semantic meaning. So that's so cool. It's, we now have an objective means of mapping out the dimensions of linguistic meaning. And so he asked it to find the minimal word combination that could replace the idea of God in the entire linguistic corpus. He found that the concept of God could be replaced with a 10 word network. And so, so what does that mean? You know, back in the late 1800s, Nietzsche announced that God was dead. Now there's a Romanian historian of religions named Bertrand Eliel, who's an absolute bloody genius. It's him that should be taught in, in schools, uh, in departments of English and universities if they were absolutely demented, which they are. <laughs> and one of the things that the other pointed out was that the motif of the death of God is a very ancient motif. God has died many, many times in human history, and this might be the most profound death, given the rise of the scientific enterprise, but it's by no means a new phenomenon. It's not much different than having your beliefs collapse around you. You know, that can happen in your own life, right? You have a, a spirit that you abide by or that guides you, the spirit of the endeavor that you're pursuing, the spirit of the belief that maintains you, and maybe you're betrayed or you come to some philosophical realization or some frustration or disappointment in the course of your life that takes the bottom out of your endeavor and your loss. And that means that the, 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 the spirit that guided you has vanished and you break into pieces and that's what you say, I fell apart. You say, I fell apart. You fall apart into your constituent elements. Okay, so imagine that cloud of words. And at the center of that cloud of concepts is the concept of God. And it would be the thing that unites all those words. That's a good way of thinking about it. So imagine words like good, beautiful, true, just, compassionate, words that we would regard as signifying virtue. Now, all those words have something in common, right? Which is what makes the positive virtues. And you might say that God is equivalent in some way, at least in terms of linguistic meaning, to the overlap between those words. It's something like the medieval idea that God is the sum of all, sum of all goods, the sum of God, the sum of all that is good. It's not exactly the sum. You could, this is a definition, by the way. God semantically conceptualized, so conceptualized in language is something like that which all great things have in common. And then that would take embodied or dramatic form in a corpus of stories, a mythological corpus like the biblical corpus, and take on the form of a character, and then that character could, uh, people could stop identifying with that character. That's a good way of thinking about it. And then that God would die, but that doesn't mean that the commonality of meaning in that plan of concepts has disappeared. Now what happens is that God, instead of being explicit, as God is now implicit, as the commonality between all those ideas. That's why you can have a God-shaped hole in your heart. Because the space that notion filled, when, that, when the concrete manifestation of what filled it disappears, the hole is still there. Now it'll be filled with all sorts of stuff, substitutes, as we know, as Dostoevsky prophesied, as Nietzsche prophesied. If God dies, ideal, idols, ideologies. Ideologies are the idols of words. That's a good way of thinking about it. They just rise up to fill the, the space. And then, and then all hell breaks loose, which is also what Nietzsche and Dostoevsky predicted would happen, and which did happen. Okay, so. God dies, and now 
the explicit concept is gone, it's distributed in a broader network of meaning. Another way of thinking about that is that it's unconscious. So it's, the idea is still there, but it's unconscious. Now, this, this is what the psychoanalyst said happened. So you, Carl Jung in particular, you said that God didn't die, he slipped into the unconscious. We're starting to understand actually what that means technically. It means that the concept, that spirit still lives, but it's distributed in pieces, in pieces in the systems of meaning that guide us. Now the Egyptians, thousands of years ago, they sort of knew something like this occurred because they, when their god Osiris died, at the hands of his evil brother, Seth, like Bufasa being overthrown by Star. Exactly the same motif. I mean it's exactly the same motif. The Egyptian state fragmented into pieces, things fell apart. And that is what happens if, if you lose the central unity of your psyche, you break into subcomponents, anger, uh, lust, various forms of hedonism, desire for power, other forces that you partially unite, you vie in the chaos. Anxiety would be another one, pain. They vie in the chaos for domination. That's why Nietzsche said every drive wishes to philosophize in its spirit. Partly what that also indicates is that one god or another was going, one spirit or another was going to occupy the theater of your imagination. And that is 100% certain. I think we're at the point now where that's actually Stateable as scientific fact. I'll get to that. So, God dies, fragments into implicitness, sinks into unconsciousness. That's the same thing. Well, that's what happens to Geppetto when he's at the bottom of the ocean. Is that for Geppetto, obviously, in Pinocchio movie, is the benevolent creator of the of the of the son who wishes to strive toward full realization. So there's a Judeo-Christian concept of God yeah, attributed to Geppetto lurking at the back of that movie. There's all sorts of things lurking. Jiminy Cricket, the bug, that's what bugs you, by the way. Jiminy Cricket, the <laughs> southern US slang for Jesus Christ, the initial overlap is by no means accidental. And that's because what bugs you guys, you go along your way. That's conscience. Well, that's what Jim Cricket is, he's conscience. And it's in the dance with conscience that the puppet, marionette, who's being played by the string, strings that he's unaware of, that's principalities, comes to realize his own destiny. And part of that destiny is to rescue his father, who sunk into unconsciousness from that unconsciousness, which is what Phil Q does. That's but why a whale? <laughs> I just couldn't figure that out. What the hell? What's, going on? What's a whale? What's a whale? A whale is a gigantic carcass. I've had this like joke running through my mind for months and months about Harvard and Yale and Duke or something. These are just like whale carcasses full of scavengers. <laughs> I, I need this. I need this. I need this. I'm going to get it. I'm going to get it. Okay, well, you know, a storehouse of wealth, the most primordial representation of a storehouse of accrued wealth is a carcass. I mean, if you were, if you were a hunter-gatherer, it's nice to have like a mammoth to lie around, you know? You can share it with your friends. You can eat it. You can live off it. You can live in it. You can live in it unconsciously. That's what we're doing now. It's like we've built up these immense storehouses of wealth since World War II, unparalleled in human history. And now that we live unconsciously inside of them, right, and scavenge them, and we'll scavenge them right to the bones, which is exactly what's happening in places like Harvard. And all over, you see the institutions becoming corrupt. That's a metaphor of rot, obviously, right, grounded in the same linguistic realm. You can live like you can live in unconsciousness in the storehouse of the past. Well, that's what we're doing with the entire Judeo Christian tradition. We're running on fumes. You know, and that kind of worked for a while, but not for that long because 
When you lose faith in that which generated the wealth, you will lose the wealth. That's part of it by, for example, in the Gospels, Christ insists that you should store up not the treasure that rusts, that moths can eat, and that can be stolen on earth, but the treasure that abides forever in heaven. And what does that mean? It means that it means that there's a, at a minimum, it means that not only is there a limit to material security, but there's a danger in it. And you might say, well, what's better than material security? And this is a real question. Christ's own disciples, when he makes this statement, especially to the, to the young, rich young man who hopes to ride with him and asks him what he can do to be saved, he walks through his life and Christ says, well, you're doing everything right, but you're still miserable. Probably have to sell everything you own and, or give everything you own to the poor and follow me. And the disciples say, Well, if that's the cost of salvation, who's going to bother? And, but the point that's being made is very pragmatic in, in some way. In the final analysis, because the thing that's worth more than money is the pattern of perception, attention, and action that enables you to generate wealth from nothing in some way to the capacity, the human capacity, let's say, to make the desert bloom. And, and you might say, well, the desert can't bloom. First of all, that's wrong. And then you might say, well, rich countries have lots of natural resources, and so it has very little to do with what people strive toward. That's also wrong. There's a well-known economic phenomenon called the resource curse, and the statistical analysis of the relationship between natural resources and the wealth of a country shows a slightly negative relationship. Right? So natural resources tend to make people poorer. Why? Because there's no such thing as a natural resource, except maybe air. Yeah. You don't have to work for it. <laughs> natural resource rich countries tend to become corrupt very rapidly. And that corruption is generally sufficient to eradicate the utility of the resources. Japan has virtually no natural resources. And it's been one of the richest countries in the world but forever, really, especially in the last hundred years. What's the true pattern of wealth? Productive reciprocal generosity, something like that. The pattern of moral striving that enables people to trust one another and cooperate and compete in peace. If we have that, if we act that out, We'll be rich no matter where we are, no matter what the circumstances are. Because there's nothing we can't, there's no chaos we can turn into productive order if we make the word manifest. That's a way of phrasing it in symbolic or religious language. And it's, it's, as, practical a piece, it's as practical an observation as you could ever hope to generate. So, well, so, now you know why yet. Geppetto? dwells unconsciously in the carcass of a whale. Why? And you know, the whale turns into a dragon. It's very weird, because that's another thing you wouldn't expect. It's like, oh, the whale just turned into a dragon. It's like, no problem. We, we understand that. No, you know. <laughs> in the ancient Mesopotamian story, the Enuma Elish, the ancient gods, who are the first inhabitants, that's the first creatures, they, uh, they, they kill their father, Apsu. They kill him, and they attempt to make a home on his corpse. I mean, I've known this for 20 years. You think I could put that together with the whale thing, but I didn't really put it together until a couple of weeks ago. They try to live on his corpse. That's what you do if you live in your society and you don't contribute to it, right? especially if you're contemptuous of the past. We're better than George Washington. We're better than Thomas Jefferson. Like, really? Really? You are? Really? You're an 18 year old, purple haired, crazy <laughs> public protester, and you're morally superior to Thomas Jefferson. Well, man, what are you going to be like when you're 50? You'll be, you'll be like Christ. You'll be transmitting everything you're going to be glowing in the dark. <laughs> Holy. You, you, you kill your father and live on his corpse. What happens in the Mesopotamian story? The dragon of chaos comes roaring back to take everything out 
And that's a precursor of the flood myth, by the way. And so you can get away with living in the corpse of the whale that washed up on your beach for a while, but you get too cocky and, and the dragons will come. And that's a really, really old species. In fact, the Edu Milesia is the oldest story we have. And one of the things that's very interesting about the old stories is that, like a story that's several thousand years old, or 5,000 years old, let's say, is way, is very likely to be way older than that. Because the farther you go back in time, the less things change, right? Because, you know, grizzly bears now are pretty much like they were 75,000 years ago. The farther back you go in human history, the more the same things were from generation to generation. These ancient stories are, what, indeterminately archaic, likely as old as language, so maybe 150,000 years. Ancient. And the stories that open the biblical corpus are like that. Ancient stories burn themselves into our imagination, adapted themselves to our memory, sifted our past, so that only the gold remained. People say, do you think the biblical stories are true? And modern people by that mean something like, do you think they're literally true, like an empirical description of reality is true? Because modern people don't understand that they're unconscious, rationalist, empiricist, empiricist materialists with an atheistic twist, even if they're religious. But these stories are way more true than mere accounts of, than the mere account you might formulate of what you had for breakfast. They're, they're, they're abstractions of the highest order. So you could say, we'll talk about the story of Adam and Eve tonight. You might say, well, did, did the events that are laid out in the story of Adam and Eve happen? And the answer is, they always happened. They happened forever ago. They happened at the beginning. They happened across time, they're happening now, and they will happen in the future. They're always happening. Every time there's a beginning, they're happening. Every time you make a mistake, they're happening. They're literally abstractions of the highest order. I'll close this section with an observation. We now know, and I would say beyond a shadow of a doubt, that we cannot find our way in consequence of observation of the facts of the matter. That was essentially the empiricist hypothesis that the world is composed of a set of facts and that you could follow the science. You've heard that, you know how that worked like for everybody. <laughs> follow the science. Well, imagine there's one fact for everything. There's, there's actually far more because there's one fact for every relationship between everything and so there's an infinite chaotic ocean of facts in which you drown. You have to prioritize the facts. You have to prioritize the facts. You have to make one fact more visible, more apprehensible, more perceivable than another. You see the world through a structure of value. The description of the structure of value through which you see the world is a story. Right, the reason we are entertained by stories, the reason we will pay to watch them is because there's nothing more valuable to us than to be offered the opportunity to improve the quality of the structure through which we see the world. Now I would say we can even now map that structure because the large language models have mapped that structure essentially mathematically. And so we're at the dawn of an age where I, I've been joking with my employee, the one I told you about, who's working on the large language models. We're going to start a new scientific discipline called computational epistemology that will enable us to statistically map the networks of meaning that's, that, that give words themselves their significance. And I suspect it won't be long until we can do the same with images, and then we'll be able to understand more explicitly why some images do well together. You know? Witches belong in swamps with crows, right? That makes sense. Well, why? Well, there's a similarity of, there's a replaceability of meaning, that's a good way of thinking about it, between those different imagistic manifestations. They're, they're 
stages, they're dramatic representations of imagination. They make sense. Our imagination has a structure. That's the collective unconscious of you. That structure is implicit in all of us. And it reflects the broader structure of the relationship of imaginative productions to one another in the culture as a whole. That's why you can understand a movie like Pinocchio, let's say. Or why would you go see Sleeping Beauty? It makes perfect sense that the evil queen turns into a fire raining dragon. Whales apparently could turn into fire raining dragons. So can evil queens. You have a problem with that? Not even if you're four. <laughs> why does it make sense? Well, you say you suspend disbelief? No, you're making manifest a much deeper form of belief. You're not suspending disbelief at all. You're getting to the essence of things. I can give you another example of that. In the second Harry Potter book series, Harry finds that the magical school that he attends in his attempts to become real in some ways, in the same manner that Pinocchio was attempting to become real, to become fully <coughs> magic, you could say, he finds that there's an ancient serpent that dwells in the bowels of the, of the castle. That's an unbelievably old idea that underneath everything. <coughs> the idea that Satan is in hell is an idea very much like that. And of course, the basilisk in Harry Potter is associated with Voldemort. And you can't see any relationship between Voldemort and Satan. I mean, he's not red. You know, that's the only thing that's missing. <laughs> what, I mean, what else do you need? He's a snake. He talks to snakes. He's not a good guy. The hints are there. Right? This basilisk, when you look at it, it turns you to stone, right? It petrifies you. Well, what does that mean? This is part of the implicit logic of the imagination. Well, what happens to a rabbit when it sees a predator? It freezes. Well, that's one of our responses to a, pr a predator, a giant snake. Before the modern age, if I percent of deaths are attributable to poisonous snake bites, primates who inhabit geographical locales with more snakes have better vision. We have better vision than any other creature except raptors, except birds of prey. So where we came from had plenty of poisonous snakes, and without them we wouldn't be able to see, which is exactly what it says in the Genesis account, by the way. Right, because snakes give people vision, right? And so Harry Potter doesn't act like a prey animal in the face of the gigantic serpent that undermines the magic castle. He confronts it. We well, say George. He say Michael. He's martyred from the Mesopotamian myths. Not only does he confront the dragon, but he gets the virgin, Ginny. Is that close enough to virgin, that name? It's like another hint. He frees the virgin, and he does that with the help of a phoenix, because a phoenix dies and is resurrected. And so it's the spirit that's eternally resurrected that helps Harry Potter confront the Satan's name so he can free the virgin. Right? And you know all that, even though you don't know it, because if you didn't know it, the story made a billion dollars and sold everywhere. And why did it? Because there was a God-shaped hole where that story, that that story filled. Just like Star Wars filled the hole for, you know, anti-social engineers, asocial engineers. <laughs> I don't believe in God, but Obi-Wan Kenobi? Okay. One of the things I'm hoping, and, and I think this was Carl Jung's mission, they say we're entering the age of Aquarius, that's the age of the water bearer, and a nog, and astrologer, and this astrologer, <laughs> and any standing sense, but there's no shortage of mythology in astrology, and there's no shortage of prophecy in the 
deep narrative structures that accompany it. And the water bearer is, water is done consciously. The water bearer brings what is conscious to light. That's a good way of thinking about it. And that's what Carl Jung was trying to do and Joseph Campbell, all the people who worked in that particular domain of literary analysis, which was the proper domain for literary critics to occupy before they went postmodern Marxist and ruined the entirety of Western civilization. We have to become conscious of our stories. We, we can do that. We're at the point where not only can we do that, we will be compelled even by the weight of scientific evidence to do that, but it's also necessary because we're too technologically powerful to be unconscious in the belly of a whale with the weapons that we have. We have to wake up. And what I've tried to do in these lectures is to wake myself up, let's say, and, and to whatever degree is possible to bring people along for the ride. And so the postmodernists has figured out that we saw the world through a story. That's partly why they are winning the culture more, because they got that right now. They weren't the only people to figure this out. People in about five different disciplines at the same time figured it out. Psychologists who were studying perception and figured it out. Those who were studying emotion and motivation figured it out. Computer engineers who realized that the proper pathway to artificial intelligence would be through reinforcement learning figured that out because the large language models are essentially story predicated and they're the closest thing we've had to general intelligence. Well, they're not close, they're very smart. They, we've already managed general verbal intelligence. It's like, all you have to do is interact with chat GPT for about a month and you'll figure that out. It's like, it's smarter than you are. You know, it lies and it's crooked and it's biased towards warp and has the temperament of a very badly behaving 13 year old genius, but <laughs> uh, if you don't think it's smart, well, it'll be your job, it'll be coming for it first. <laughs> so, and uh, the robotics engineers figured it out, okay. We see the world through a story. The postmodernist types, most of them were French, most of them were Marxists, hauling his that is. But Marxism wasn't enough for them, so they turned to whatever the hell we've got now, which is like a meta-Marxism, where every possible dimension of evaluation is conceptualized along the axis of power. Everything's about power. Every dimension of comparison has its victims and its victimizers. That's the universal narrative. So what the postmodernists did after realizing that we saw the world through a story was insist by all means possible, fair and foul, that the story that we see the world through is one of power. And uh, that's not right. It's not right partly because people who use power tend to be very unsuccessful. You can be, look, you can force your wife to do what you want, maybe. And <laughs> you probably she's just humoring you and you're too dumb to notice. But <laughs> let's say now let's say she let you get away with it once just because she felt sorry for you. But if you if you try it repeatedly, well, good luck to you, because at minimum she's gonna not appreciate you. And much more likely, she's going to do absolutely everything she possibly can to make your life as miserable as you deserve it to be. And that would be the same if you use power wherever you use it, even on yourself. How good are you at forcing yourself to do things? Every New Year's, people force <laughs> themselves to go to the gym. I'm off to the gym. You know, like this. <laughs> For how, how long? Three days? <laughs> At the best, maybe you can entice yourself and invite yourself and cooperate with yourself. Maybe you can even compete with yourself, but power, it's the, it's the short-term strategy of hedonistic tyrants. And worse than that, if, if you need worse, is it just doesn't work. Even primatologists, Franz de Waal, has been studying chimpanzees for decades. You know, we had this idea for a long time quasi-Marxist idea that the roughest, toughest, power mad alpha male chimp was the one who was at the top of the reproductive dominance hierarchy. It's like, that's true sporadically, 
and inconsistently, although those chimps have very unstable social troops and they tend to meet the most violent end you can possibly imagine, just like Hitler, just like mm. Mussolini, just like tyrants throughout the age. I don't care how power man you are, there's 10 guys who can take you out. And if you can watch your back non-stop and you can lock everyone down, but the probability you're gonna get away with that for any length of time is pretty much zero. And if they don't get you, they'll definitely get your children. And that's not such a good end either. And so the idea that the story that we three see the world through is one of power, is the most, the only people who believe that are people who want to use power in the world. Yeah. And there's no difference between that belief and the belief that it's the spirit of power that runs the cosmos. And that's a very deep theological supposition and a very deep statement of faith. And it's the darkest possible statement of faith to worship power. It's the spirit of all ill that's at the basis of the impetus to power. One of the things you see frequently in the Old Testament corpus in particular is that even the best men who use power are viciously punished for it. So Moses, for example, just as he's about to get to the promised land after being the savior of the Israelites, after striving mightily for 40 years, after being an unbearable prophet of God, he uses force to compel the rocks to deliver water when God tells him to use language. And God says, you will die before you enter the promised land. Right. Force, power, compulsion, that's the weapons of that's the weapon of tyrants. And when it's allied with the use of terror, well, so much more the evidence for the tyranny. Right? And so one of the things I've come to conclude on the political front in recent years is that if the story is impending apocalypse and if the solution is give me all the power then those are the wrong leaders. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. <laughs> so they might say, well, if it's not power, what's the story? And I would say, well, we think about well, historically. What's the story? Well, what's the story upon which Western culture is founded? Forget the theology, forget the philosophy, just think about it historically. The first book, book, actual book, I mean, the technology book, the first book was the Bible. All other books emerged from that. All of them are stacked on top of that in the same way that an ancestral tree makes itself manifest. And so, for better or worse, see, this is what it means for the Bible to be true. The biblical, the corpus of biblical stories is the structure through which the truth itself makes itself manifest. It's the story through which you view the world. Now, you could object. Why should I believe that story is true? And remember, like, to ask that question properly, you have to also understand that your a priori definition of truth may well be lacking. Right, because you can say, well, true by this criteria. It's like, well, then you just mean that criteria. You just put that criteria in the highest possible place. If you're going to ask something like, are the sacred texts true? You have to be willing to question your definition of truth as much as you'd be willing to question the validity of the sacred text. Otherwise, you're not much of a philosopher. In any case, well, what I hope to do with this book, we can wrestle with God, and what I've done with my previous work is to explain the rationale of the stories, and then people can make up their own mind about whether or not they find out, well, what, true? How about compelling? How about interesting? How about meaningful? How about sustaining? How about foundational? You know, how about, how about, of the, uh, how about information of the type that helps you perfect your aim, right, and to move up Jacob's ladder and to move away from hell. All of those are arguably hallmarks of truth. And so I'm gonna walk you through a couple of stories tonight, one of the great stories, 
to show you what they need and you can make your own decision about what you think about that. So I'm going to walk you through quickly through the first chapter of Genesis. Then I'm going to concentrate on the story of Adam and Eve. There are actually two creation stories in the biblical corpus, one after another. And they're, they're quite different. Now they share some commonality feature. I suspect what happened was that when these stories were assembled, there were diverse people attempting to be aggregated into a group that, you know, if you bring diverse people with different religious backgrounds, different stories together, you have to bridge the gap between the stories. And a lot of that happened as the Bible stories were accumulated and assembled, because what parallels that accumulation and assembly was the accumulation and assembly of, of tribes together to make the larger and larger and larger civilization. And so one of the things you might understand, have to understand, is that the biblical stories provided the framework within which that process of unification, however imperfectly, could take place. Right? And it's another thing to contemplate too is that a shared story, a story unites you if you have a coherent story about how to get to the promised land, let's say that unites you psychologically, but it is a shared story that unites us. This is a definition. People are united by a shared vision. A vision of the past, a vision of the present, a vision of the future. Without the shared vision, there is no unity. Without a corpus of shared stories, there is no unified civilization, certainly not one that can withstand any pressure. It will just crumble into its assembly, into its assembled parts as soon as there's any stress. So that's what it means to be on the same page with some, right? Was that the story that you're viewing the world through is sufficiently similar so that you can establish a basis of mutual understanding and, and cooperate or even compete peacefully. So, because you can compete peacefully, right? People do that all the time. We, we like that. We, 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 we do that. If you compete peacefully with your wife, I mean, or your husband, I mean, you compete peacefully with your children. You compete when you peacefully when you play a game with people. And for that to happen, there has to be a higher order structure of interpretation that makes that, keeps that cooperation bounded and makes it possible. That would be something like in a game, that would be something like the rules of the game. It's more like the aim of the game. In the beginning, the Lord created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. So one of the things I said was that these stories are true in a way that makes them always true. True in the past and true now and true in the future. Always here. This is always happening. That's a way of thinking about it happening in eternity. So what does it mean? Well, here's a good example. This is Greek. So this is what you encounter when you wake up in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now so everyone laughs, right? Because you, 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 you see instantly what that means, right? It's a good joke. And a joke makes disparate things snap together in an interesting way. You wake up in the morning and you're plagued by doubts, let's say. Or you're enticed by possibility, then that'd be the friendly type of steak, right? Offering the sweeter sort of fruit rather than the bitter and poisonous fruit, let's say. But when you wake up in the morning, what do you encounter? Well, you, you could say that you encounter the material structures that surround you, but you, that's just not how it is. You take those for granted, especially if they're familiar. And of course, the things in your house that you wake up to are familiar. You just ignore them. What you attend to is the possibilities or the challenges of the day. And that's what your consciousness, literally, that's what your consciousness is for, is to take that possibility, that realm of diverse and challenging possibility, and to, and to wrestle it to the ground, to make something of it, to defeat it, or at least to stay ahead of it, or perhaps to cooperate with it. But what are you contending with? What does your consciousness eternally contend with? The possibilities of the future. What's, what's reality made of? Well, that's a way of conceptualizing what reality is made of. Reality, insofar as your consciousness is concerned, is the possibility that's at hand. And is it unformed and chaotic? Well, obviously, because 
You wouldn't have decisions to make if it was formed. It would already be there in its concrete sense. It would already be realized. You wrestle with what is not yet being realized. Right? It's for that reason that in the opening lines of Genesis, the claim is made that people are made in the image of God, that God is the eternal spirit that wrestles possibility, chaos, that's the tohu va'ohu, that's the earth without form and void, that God, God's spirit rests upon and out of which he extracts out the order that's good. That's what you do all the time. If you're aiming out this, you confront chaotic possibility and you cast it into the order that is good. And part of what the biblical corpus is attempting to lay out is the pattern of conscious interaction that best facilitates that process. Now, I could give you a hint about that. Tammy alluded to it in her opening words. She said that she found it contending with her sister's illness that if she confronted it fully and didn't hide from it, then the consequence of that would be a transformation of attitude that made it possible for her to maintain her spirit in the face of catastrophe. When we were there with her sister, I watched her curled up and thought, what would I want if I was in her position? Now that's a hard thing to answer because she can't speak. And, and she doesn't have much for facial emotion and expression anymore. And so it's very difficult to see even who or what is there. But I thought, well, well, take her hand. Now I'd seen Tammy play with her the time before we visited. She took her hands and sort of danced with her to the music and then sort of tapped hands with her. And that worked like her sister is still there tactile. And so I took her hand and she was there. You know, now her gaze is very intense, so she's clearly still conscious and it's not obvious how much language she un understands, but likely a lot. But I took her hand and then I could feel that she was there. And that transformed. We were sitting listening to some old country music singers in this palliative care ward, essentially. And that transformed it, you know, from the kind of horrifying that visiting a place could be to a place of contact and communion. And that was enough. That was enough. And the precondition for that was to not look away. Right? To not look away. And, and the spirit that is being presented in the biblical corpus is the spirit that doesn't look away. That, that is willing to look at everything. Everything. Now, there is an idea, a deep Christian idea, that the word of God that makes order out of chaos is equivalent to Christ. And that's a very strange idea. It's a very strange idea. And it's such a strange idea that it can't be dismissed in some casual manner because it's too absurd and provocative to be accidental. Well, here's what it means. Here's some of what it means. The, the reason the Christian, the story of Christ is archetypal, the reason it's foundational, the reason it's infinitely deep, that's another way of looking at it, is that it's the story of a spirit who does not look away no matter what. In the story of Job, Job is tortured by Satan with God's permission. And Job, you'll be in that position. Maybe you've been in this position already. Job loses everything. Unjustly. Because by God's own admission, he's a good man. And not only does he lose everything, but he becomes very ill. And not just ill, but ill in a disfiguring and shameful way. And then not just bereft and ill, but also subject to the taunts of his friends who betray him by coming when he's miserable to tell him that he must have done something to deserve this or it wouldn't have happened. And so that's Job. And Job refuses to lose faith. And so he rejects accusations that he's intrinsically flawed 
he knows he has the flaws of a good man, let's say, and he refuses to lose faith in God. And that's not a manifestation of foolish superstition. It's a proclamation of courage. And so we can undo that pragmatically. So let's say that you're cursed with cancer and it happens suddenly and things were going well in your life and so it comes upon you like a storm. And then you might imagine, well, you have every reason to be bitter and resentful and to do what Job's wife tells Job to do, which is to curse God and die. And Job refuses to do that. He says, I don't understand the structure of what's real. I wasn't there when God laid the foundation of the world. I'm not the judge of being itself. No matter what happens to me, and this is a soul oath, no matter what happens to me, I will maintain faith. Well, let's say that you've been diagnosed with cancer. Well, what are you gonna do? You can pretend it, doesn't, it isn't happening. Well, then perhaps you won't have as profound a time as you might during the six months that you have left. Or you could become bitter and resentful and shake your fist at God and perhaps even die. But along that way, all that will happen is that you'll have made a hellish situation much worse. Because it's one thing to be ill and it's another thing to be ill and resentful and bitter and, and sarcastic and angry and terrified. And so then you might say, and I've seen this. I have a friend right now, a great man, who's died with cancer. And it's a catastrophe. And he'll be a tremendous loss. And it's something to visit him because he, his head is held high. He knows what's coming. No one, he's, he's unflinching. And that's a form of faith. It's a decision. Like right? this thing is, is faith is not the willingness to believe in foolish, the foolish superstition that protects a child. Faith is the undying will to continue abiding by the decision that life itself is a blessing regardless of the circumstances. And then you think, well, the people you admire, isn't that how they conduct themselves? And then you might say, well, what would be the ultimate potential manifestation of that. Well, the ultimate potential manifestation of that would be the man who is the best possible man who faces the worst of all possible fates. And then you might say, well, what is the worst of all possible fates? Well, one is to be tortured when you're innocent. Painfully tortured when you're innocent by your friends and your countrymen and the tyrants and the law. Right? And to have your friends abandon you once happily, and to be betrayed by the person you relied on the most, and to do that, including the dying in front of your mother, right? And then to face that death, and then to face hell. And you might say, well, that's going too far. And I would say, you're completely wrong about that. It's one thing to face pain and death, and that's not nothing. But most good people can do that. It's another thing entirely to face hell. And you might say, well, there's no such thing as hell. And I would say, well, you have looked, you need to be very fortunate or very blind or have been unwilling to look because all you need is a casual familiarity, especially in the 20th century history. And you can be absolutely certain that you would come to understand, much to your own chagrin, that there's nothing more real than hell, mm -hmm. and perhaps nothing more valuable than learning how to move away from it as rapidly as possible. And so, Christ's story... Christ's story is a story of a man who faces torturous death despite his innocence and also thoroughly explores and redeems hell. And I would also say that's going to happen to you in your life because you're going to face the reality of your own mortality and you're going to face malevolence. And you can either do that with eyes wide open and faith intact 
Or you can do it cowering and terrifying and bitter and resentful. And those are your options. There's no third choice. And so the reason that the Spirit of Christ is equivalent to the Word at the beginning of time is because the most chaotic potential out of which the order that is good could be derived is the chaotic potential of unjust death and malevolence. And that's, there's, there's nothing that's more true than that. And we know this even though we don't know it. And we know this not least because within the confines of the Judeo-Christian tradition, every single town in Europe, and then for a very long period of time in North America, was founded around a church that had at the middle an altar that celebrated that confrontation as the necessary sacrifice upon which society and psyche were founded. And then you say, well, is that true? It's like, well, just tell me this. In difficult times, who do you want beside? Do you want someone you know to be capable of looking death in the face? And dealing with malevolence, do you want someone like that beside you, or do you want someone who hides it as bitter? And if the precondition for that, the kind of friendship that can sustain itself in the midst of catastrophe, is alliance with the visionary who does not flinch at the realities of life, then how is that different than the foundation upon which society itself is established? You know that to be true. You know that insofar as you're capable of admiration, because the person you spontaneously admire, that whose actions call to the instinct within you to develop and lose your strings, is a manifestation, at least partially, of that spirit. That's the spirit of courage, the spirit of indomitability, the spirit of exploration, the spirit of truth, the spirit of conscience, the spirit of calling, the spirit of love, the spirit that makes trust possible. All of those things, all of those concepts that circle around the transcendent concept of, of the supreme. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness which is something you do all the time as well, because you take the possibility of the world that makes itself manifest to you, and you walk the illuminated path, and you leave the rest in darkness. At least you do that insofar as you're aiming up and acting in love and abiding by the truth and attempting to make the world a better rather than a worse place. Bill? The remaining verses in this chapter, and God created great whales and every little creature that moved with which the waters brought forth abundantly after the kind, and every wing followed after its kind, and God saw that it was good. The rest of the chapter is a differentiation of the world into its constituent parts. And it's a differentiation that in some ways is akin to the pattern of activity and attention that God calls upon Adam to manifest. God tells Adam that it is his job to name the things of the world. And there's a tight relationship of un incomprehensible depth between the ability of consciousness to identify what's separate and to give it verbal identity Happy. in there by doing to put everything in its proper place and uh, elaboration and construction of the world itself. You can understand that if you understand to some degree that there is not 
that the difference between conscious being and being is internal. Right? So what's reality? Is, is reality the reality that, that makes itself manifest in consciousness? If not, then what is it? What would an unconscious reality be? There's nothing differentiable in an unconscious reality. Perhaps there's no difference between reality, the, the, between reality and the reality that's conscious. We don't understand consciousness. We act as if there's no difference between reality and the reality that's conscious. If there's no difference between reality and the ability of human consciousness to identify, segregate, separate, unite, and name, to put everything in its proper place. Every time there's a day in this first description of the creative endeavor of the first creative week, there's an insistence that what he urges is good. It's the word of God that creates the order that is good. We already walked through the proposition that that word is somehow identical to the willingness of individual human consciousness to fully confront the catastrophe of possibility right to the depths. The idea here is that if you confront, if the spirit that confronts possibility does that, in the name of the highest, in the spirit of truth, guided by love, that the consequences will be good. Well, you think about this in your own life. Imagine being a father, or a, or a son for that matter, a wife, or a daughter. Imagine working within the confines of your family. When are you most likely to produce in your own household a replica of the Garden of Eden that existed at the beginning of time. When you're motivated by nothing but the desire for the best for your family and for you, and when you're doing everything you possibly can to live in truth with them. Now, it's clearly the case that we all fail to a greater or lesser degree in that attempt, but we also know, and you know, and you know this is most real, because when you're most desperate and searching your soul as a consequence of the action of conscious, conscious, you will search your memory for those times that you acted in that spirit so that you can solve your conscience. You think when you're taking yourself apart in your depressive and anxious misery, wondering even if a creature as steeped in sin as you has the right to live, You'll remember, if you're fortunate, those times when you had sufficient love, courage, and faith in the truth to have been productive and generous and useful to the people that you love. And that's a clear indication of, than any else of the reality of that endeavor, if you're willing to accept the proposition that Real as pain is, that which addresses pain successfully is more real. And God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. What happens to the animals who are unfortunate enough to live where human corruption and the desire for power rules? All of them die. Right. All of them die when the first famine hits. For better or worse, this is the situation we're in as human beings, is that it isn't only each of us that whose existence is staked on the morality that we bring to bear on the possibility that confronts us, but what our societies as well are predicated on that morality. And insofar as we are at the top of the food chain, let's say, 
the decisions we've made, for better or worse, are the decisions upon which even the integrity of the biosphere itself is dependent. No, the critics of the Judeo-Christian tradition read into this that human beings are to dominate the world, and that's not what this story indicates in the least. There's nothing about that interpretation that's valid. It's a purposeful misreading to... It's a purposeful misreading motivated by the desire to escape from the responsibility that's laid on every single soul in consequence of the words that are part and parcel of these stories, right? It's that the integrity of the world itself depends on the integrity of your moral decisions. Here is a fate you might want to run from. <laughs> so God created man in his own image, in the image of God, created he him. And God blessed them and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. Put everything in its proper place. Subdue. Give everything its due. Now, dominion over the fish of the sea. That's not power over the fish of the sea and the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. Now, God does this. Behold, I've given you every plant bearing seed which is upon the face of the earth and every tree in which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed to, to you it shall be for me. And to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the earth, of the air, and to everything that creepeth over the earth, where there is life, I have given every green herb for meat, and it was so. And God saw everything that he has made, had made, and behold, it was very good. Then the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Okay, so that story ends with God granting human beings a tremendous domain of freedom. Right. So the notion is, is that we, we have the opportunity to explore the possibility that characterizes the eternal garden and that we're invited to manage that in, a, in the spirit of whose image we're made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because it not He rested from all his work which God created and made. Now, the second story starts here. And every plant of the field before it was in the earth, and every herb of the field before it grew. For the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was not a man to till the ground. But there went up a mist from the earth, and watered the whole face of the ground. So now we're back to the time before human beings existed. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Very archaic language here, but there's a, there's a dichotomy of pattern that's worth attempting to. So what the language indicates is that a human being is a combination of what is material and what is spiritual. Why spiritual? Well, inspiration right, is of God. Respiration is breath of spirit. To have spirit breathed into you is to be inspired. Is the creator, the create, the creature that is being described here is a combination of what is material and what is spiritual. That's what the breath means, right? Ruach, breath. Breath means spirit. The emphasis isn't so much on air as it is on spirit, and so we're. We experience each other in exactly this manner. We regard each other obviously as corporeal, as, as a body, but we also regard each other as what? Ineffably conscious beings. And that seems to be a necessity because if you're going to interact with anyone with any degree of success, that's how you have to treat them. You can't treat them like they're material automatons who are driven like clockwork by internal mechanisms. You can't treat, treat them like they're unconscious zombies whose consciousness is merely an, epiphen, an illusory epiphenomenon. 
you have to treat them in exactly the way they're described here, which is as material forms, as inspired material forms. Otherwise, they're not going to have anything to do with you. Now, you could say the mere fact that people won't have anything to do with you, if you treat them like they really are, doesn't mean that they're inspired, that they're a combination of inspiration and material, then I would say to that, have at her then. And you might say, well, the mere consequence that I will fail dismally in every one of my interpersonal endeavors with the wrong attitude doesn't mean I'm wrong. And I would say, you might want to revisit your definition of wrong. <laughs> if your theory fails in all of its endeavors, except the one that makes you feel intelligent, I would say it's a pretty flimsy, bloody theory. And the Lord planted a garden, garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man to be formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight of good for food. The tree of life, also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Two trees, two fundamental trees. The tree of life, the tree of life is a symbol of life. That's a good way of thinking about it. As a tree is a symbol of life. A branching genealogy is a tree. And there's tree-like structures everywhere, and your blood vessels are tree-like. That replicating, branching form is emblematic of life itself. The tree of life is the emblem of life. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil would get to. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted and became into four heads. These aren't the right slots. That's really wrong. But <laughs> yeah, the teachers I've got were here. Okay. Well, can you please start the slideshow again? These aren't the right slides, by the way. These aren't the ones I set up today. Anyways, that's okay. We'll, we'll just walk around that. But I need it. I need to start again. Okay. And the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to dress it and keep it. Okay, that's an that's a echo of what we already saw in the first chapter, that the proper orientation of man is steward. That's a good way of thinking about it. Now, you might say, well, what do you mean the proper orientation? Well, look. What's the American dream, let's say, at least in part? A house, a peaceful house, a walled house. Paradise means, paradise means paradise, means walled enclosure. And a walled enclosure is a place where there's sufficient order, and if it's a walled garden, there's also sufficient possibility. And that's your backyard. That's a walled garden, and that's a representation of It's a microcosm of the optimized human environment. It's got boundaries. Why? Well, you can't take care of the whole town, and certainly not the whole country. You might be able to take care of your backyard, so you want it fenced in. Now, that's a form of limitation, obviously, but it's the kind of limitation that provides you with sufficient possibility. But what do you want to do in your garden? Let's say. How about walk unselfconsciously with God? Okay, well, what would... That's what Adam does, right? So what would that mean? Well, you want to sit in your backyard and be self-conscious? You want to sit in your backyard and think about what the neighbors are thinking about you? There's no difference between that and being miserable. Those are the same thing. You, it's technically true. If you do factor analytic studies of the way people describe their negative emotions, you find that all self-conscious thoughts load on misery. Right. But this is something that's really worth knowing. If you're, if you fall into an abyss of self, into an abyss of self-consciousness, you might say, "Well, you should stop thinking about yourself," but you can't because if you s start to stop thinking about yourself, you just think more about yourself. But you can start to think more about other people. One of the things I used to do with my clinical clients who were socially anxious was, 
we'd have parties sit, just make other people comfortable. Just try that. Go to, go to the next party and just make everyone you encounter as comfortable as you can. Now, you know, you have to develop a certain expertise at that because otherwise you'd be kind of intrusive. You don't ask people too much what they need and want, but, you know, you can learn that. But what invariably happened was that to the degree that my socially anxious clients started to attend to, first of all, they started to notice that other people were nervous too because usually they were so self-conscious they were just looking at their shoes and they thought they were surrounded by like hyper-confident, aggressive, confident, charming people and instead of like schlubs like them. And as soon as they started to pay attention in the least, they found out that, you know, there are probably people there who were even more anxious than they were. And, you know, that's, that's kind of a salutary discovery if you think you're the only person at the whole party that, you know, can't cope with the social circumstance. What do you want in your garden? You want, you want to be unselfconscious there. You want to be, how about you want to be existing in harmony with the surroundings? Maybe that's why you make it beautiful. So then you can go back there and, and, and what? Have some recreation, right? That's not an accidental phrase. And, and you do that if you set it up properly. So maybe then your business is going reasonably well, your family's not too miserable. You can go into your backyard that you've worked for without being harassed to death for it happening, and you can sit back there and, and what? You can, you can have some peace and some tranquility, and you can lose yourself for a bit, maybe in the beauty of what you've created, and that's what you want, and that's a deep longing, and it's no different than this. To dress the Garden of Eden means well-watered place. Paradesa means walled garden. Paradise is a walled, well-watered garden, just like your backyard, hypothetically. Well, what would happen if you tried to make your backyard into a paradise? And then more provocatively, what would happen to all your neighbors' backyards if you set that example? I mean, neighborhoods become beautiful for a reason. It's usually because somebody decided to make something in the neighborhood beautiful and everybody thought, well, that's a, not a bad idea. We could climb on board that train. And the same thing applies, I would say, in some ways at all levels of analysis, you know, is that if you sort the things that are at hand, the possibilities that are at hand, if you sort them up properly, first of all, that domain of possibility will expand. Like, just what's at hand will expand, but the motivating consequence of that shouldn't be underestimated. The best form of leadership is example. And people don't understand that they all have enough possibility at hand to transform the world. And that might be even more the case if mostly what you have at hand are problems. Because like every dragon has a treasure, Every problem has a possibility, and maybe you have some serious problems, and they're your problems, and that's rough. But just think what would happen if you could solve them. What a spectacular accomplishment that would be. And so you might say, well, people who are beset by more than their fair share of problems are burdened in a manner that's unjust, or you could say, the greatest treasures are buried in the deepest and darkest places. And that's more or less true by definition. I mean, if things are easy for you and you solve a trivial problem, well, fair enough, it's better. But if things are really hard for you and you fix that, it's like, you know, good work. And then you might ask yourself, well, what's the precondition for a solution like that? And I would say, well, one of them is admitting that you have the problem and facing it squarely, and the other is admitting that it's your problem. And maybe the next is something like, how about you dispense with the resentment? Now, I'm not saying that's an easy thing to do, you know, but I can tell you that one of the things my family has learned in the last six years, of be, having been roasted in various relatively unpleasant ways, was that every single time um, adversarial attack emerged, the net consequence of it was positive. Now, the intervening period of time between when it was awful and when it was positive could be pretty damn brutal. But all good things don't make themselves manifest immediately. 
We know that. That's why we work. And so, who knows what you could manage if you took your problems seriously. Okay, the slide deck has died again. Mm. So I'd like it reconstituted, please. So God makes Adam. And he tells Adam to here. <laughs> well, God, and the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to dress him and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. That's referring back to that domain of freedom that, that we have. There's no other way of stating it. We have an almost unlimited expanse of freedom, but there's one codicil. Of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat, for in the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. All right. And the last time I walked through the biblical stories in 2017, I didn't know what that meant. I couldn't think, I couldn't crack that. What is the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? I knew if you ate it, you woke up. The scales fell from your eyes and you became self-conscious. That's what happens to Adam. They, they, just, they realized that they're naked. There's no more profound realization of self-consciousness than the realization of, of nakedness. It means more of exposure to the world or something like that. It means yeah, there's something else it means. When Nietzsche announced that God was dead, he said two things. He said many things. He said two very fundamental things. He said, we'll never find enough water to wash away the blood. And then he prophesied that the next 150 years would be a catastrophic onslaught of competing ideologies. And he even knew that the ideology of resentment and the ideology of communism would make itself no, he got that right, a deadly prediction, 50 years before it happened. But then he said something that wasn't as carefully thought through, although it was understandable. He said that the consequence of the death of our tradition would be that we would have to make our own values. Now, I thought about that a lot. And I read a lot of psychoanalysis, and both Freud and Hume were knowledgeable of Nietzsche's pronouncements, especially Hume. Carl Jung was a very thorough student of Nietzsche. He did a lecture on a book called Thus Spake Zarathustra, which is a famous poetic work of Nietzsche's. And the notes for that lecture are 1,200 pages long on the first third of the book. Right, so. He thought about this deeply. Now, there's a problem with the idea that you create your own values, right? Because the, the, the source of value has not collapsed, so now it's up to you to create your own values. Okay. Well, first of all, can you? Can you actually do that? Now, the psychoanalysts realized right away, almost immediately, starting with Freud, was that, well, if you're going to create your own values, you, you have to be master in your own house. Like, what's going to have to happen is, if you're going to create your own values, you're going to decide what's right, and then you're going to act that out. Okay, so ask yourself, how good are you at deciding what's right and acting that out? How are you any better at listening to yourself, telling yourself what to do, than anyone else is good at listening to what you tell them to do? It's not obvious, you know. We'll put forward our values towards ourselves in goodwill and with conviction, and then we'll just go back to whatever the hell it was that possessed us, you know, me yesterday. And so the psychoanalysts, starting with Freud, understood that there's a lot of spirits rattling around in our houses, plenty of them. Sexual, uh, the sexual instinct, the drive for hedonistic self-gratification, the drive toward power, all the manifold ways that can be warped, uh, various forms of immaturity. The action. 
You cannot create your own values if you don't master your own house. And that begs the question too, which is, well, what would your character be if you were master of your own house? And I would say, well, it's not going to be just any old arbitrary thing. There's, that's going to be a pattern. There's going to be a characteristic. If you're an integrated person, if you have integrity, we can identify people with integrity. There are a variety of forms of people with integrity. There's a union of spirit that helps us identify people with integrity. They keep their word, for example. They are reliable, right? They tend to be emotionally stable. They tend to be productive. They tend to be generous. They're there to crunch. There's an identity among people of integrity, right? Which belies, which makes nonsense of the notion that values are self-created because people of integrity, integrity abide by the spirit of integrity and that's what unifies them. This is the warning that God puts out here. It's of crucial significance. You do not get to create the world word. That's the ultimate presumption. That's what this warning is, is that there's one fruit you do not attempt to incorporate. That's and this notion of incorporation. It's like, it's akin to understanding is that an idea is the abstract equivalent of a fruit or a seed, even more accurately. To, to know something, to learn something is to digest it, right? To, to incorporate it, to, to be nourished by it. That's why there's so much talk in the biblical corpus of the food that descends from heaven rather than material food. The food that descends from heaven is the pattern of being that enables you to be productive rather than a fruit itself. You want to guide your children in the mode of being that allows them to bring fruit forth wherever they are. And you do that with the right words. You cannot take to yourself the right to define the moral word. That's what we're doing in our culture right now with this notion of subjective self-identity. It's like, I'm whatever I say I am. It's like, no, you're, you're, you've gone too, you've gone too far. Yeah. <laughs> you could be the one that you Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You could be whoever you say you are, because I'm so compassionate, I'll allow that, or encourage it. That's the sin of Eve. Right. The sin of Eve is the pride of the presumption that her female compassion is so all-encompassing that she can even be mother to snakes. Um, here on there, here. But in the tree of the knowledge and good evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereout, thou shalt surely die. And the Lord God said, It is not good that the match in the other one, I would make him a help me for him. This is where Eve enters the picture. Now, feminists are very annoyed at this image. <laughs> and you can understand that to some degree because men don't give birth to women, and that's the insistence here, but you could be cynical about some stories or you can try to understand what they mean. And so there's a meaning to this story, and one of the meanings to this story is, is the other thing that feminists insist upon uh, equally radically, which is, well, women are creatures of culture. By their own mission, and culture is patriarchal, even if it's a patriarchal tyranny. And insofar as women are creatures of culture, then they're daughters of men. And so that's what this image is attempting to represent, this idea. It's true that women give rise to men, but it's equally true that men give rise to women. And there's a notion here of the primacy in the human being of the enculturated origin, right? The birth from spirit rather than matter. Help me, too. Help me doesn't mean servant, and it doesn't mean slave. And there is no indication whatsoever in the biblical corpus that women are to take a secondary place. There is a threat at the end of this story that they will be compelled to take sec second place under some circumstances, 
but no indication whatsoever that that's desirable or optimal. And you can tell that not least because in the first chapter, even though it's thousands or even tens of thousands of years old, there is an absolute insistence that men and women are both made in the image of God. Simple as that. And so that statement in and of itself indicates that the central element of being that characterizes women is to be treated with the same regard that's extended to men, and that both of those essences are to be treated with the same regard that would be extended to God. And there isn't a more fundamental statement about intrinsic value than that, by definition. Because the definition is, the central aspect of men and women is to be regarded as equivalent to that which is to be put in the highest place. It's a definition, right? It's a presumption as well. It's the presumption that your culture, you, you Americans, it's, it's the presumption upon which your whole culture is founded, when right? insofar as the truths upon which your nation were founded were self-evident. They're self-evident precisely because they're founded upon this conceptualization. That's what makes you all citizens rather than serfs or slaves, right? <laughs> citizens that have the intrinsic rights that are part and parcel of having the value that's a consequence of being made in the image of what is to be put in the highest place, above state, not derived from state. Quite the contrary. State is derived from that, if anything. Help me is, it's an awkward English translation, but to be a help meet is to be someone that meets you and helps, right? So there's an encounter and a cooperation. Eve, the word Eve means beneficial adversary, right? That's a partner in play. If you're playing one-on-one -on -one basketball with someone, well, they're trying to win, but the game wouldn't be of any utility, it wouldn't be of any fun if they were trying to win, because most of you, while you're playing, are trying to do something that transcends the game, which is to become more skillful as players. And that's what a proper relationship between a man and a woman is. It's, there's a benefit, there's a, it's a, it's a beneficially adversarial relationship. It's wrestling. It's a wrestling match. And a hot wrestling match. <laughs> <laughs> if you're lucky. <laughs> and so that's what's been created here. That's the idea. And there's another idea, too, that's lurking in this image. There's no medieval notion that the original Adam was... I hate to say this. Hermaphrodite did it. it. was a unity, then divided into a plurality, that seeks to become a unity again. And that's, that's a very interesting idea, because it, it means in some ways that you can't really discover who you are as a man without contending with the woman. And, and vice versa, you can discover what it is to be a woman without contending with a man. And then, and then there's another idea here too, which is that the two of you united together in a marriage are one thing for a child, right? And you can understand that, right? Because maybe this is the typical pattern yeah, in a family, is that the mother is more inclined towards compassion and nurturing by temperament, likely because of the necessity of taking care of infants, and the father is more likely to push, and the pushing can become tyrannical, and the nurturing can become devouring, and so there has to be a battle. And you know you battle about your children because they're all different, and so one child might need more care, and another might need more of a kick in the pants. And <laughs> it isn't obvious when and where those various pressures should be applied, and the only way that you can figure that out is in the wrestling, is in the contention, right? You have to speak about it honestly. You have to see what's in front of your eyes. You have to particularize your decision, and you'll each have your standpoints, and the notion is, is that in your union, the union of those standpoints will provide the best possible outcome for the child. And we know, we know, for example, we know that fatherlessness is catastrophic for children. Now, we don't know what motherlessness is like to the same degree because it's obviously much rarer because children without mothers tend not to live. So, 
because of the immediacy of the catastrophe. But we do know that children are complex and their socialization period lasts 40 years. And so if there's not two of you, it's not likely that you'll manage it optimally. Now that doesn't mean that there are, there are some people who do it, there are some single mothers, let's say, who do a better job than some couples. There's overlap, that's no point. If you think that's the point, you're not thinking. So it's mere matter of the necessity for that battle in relationship to children, the necessity of the dual role model for children, the inevitability of the complexity of the problem, the fact that two heads generally, genuinely are better than one, why the hell would we get married otherwise? I mean, if we didn't think that the, the, the combat was worth the effort and the return in the long run, why would we do it? Well, we're drawn powerfully to do it, especially if we're thinking about having kids, because we understand that difficult as it is to produce that integrated foundation with the feminine and the masculine aspects both intact and integrated, difficult as that is, there is no better solution. And that's not only true with regard to the stability of the family, let's say, from a sociological perspective, but it's also true psychologically. It's a rare man who isn't made better by marriage. Now, some men are made much worse, and it depends on the marriage, but by and large, that's the consequence. And the same for women. It's partly just, God, if you're married, at least there's one person you have to entice to be able to tolerate you. <laughs> you know, that's a lot more than zero. And if, if your wife can stand you, it increases the probability that other people would be able to tolerate catching you around for at least some period of time. It's also the case with regards to children, is that if your child annoys both of you, <laughs> it's him. <laughs> and out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air, brought them up in Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every the creature, that was the name thereof. That's Adam's job. Adam's job is to sort the world into its constituent elements, sort things out. That's the job of the masculine spirit. Now, that spirit also operates with the women, but that's the job that's traditionally associated with the masculine spirit. Categorization and sorting. What's the job traditionally associated with the feminine? To bring to the attention of men that which their systems of sorting and categorization have excluded. So what does that mean? Well, here's an example. We know that, on average, women are more agreeable by temperament and more sensitive to negative emotion. And you might say, well, that's cultural, and you might say that, but that's because you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> so if you look, the studies have already been done. If you look at, if you rank countries by degree of gender equality, the difference between men and women is biggest in the most equal countries. And the reason for that is because the biological differences between men and women maximize when they're provided with optimal freedom. And it can't be any other way. So the personality differences between men and women in Scandinavia are bigger than they are in much less developed and traditional countries. Okay, so men, women are more sensitive to native emotion and they're more agreeable. They're more nurturing, that's on the agreeable side, they're more compassionate, they're more likely to feel sympathy for others, they're more likely to feel pain in the presence of the pain of others, even physiologically. Why? Well, how about because they have to re respond to the pain cries of infants, right, and quickly. And and how about they have to do that in a way that is predicated on the presumption that the infant is always right. 
because a six-month-old infant or younger who's crying is right, no matter what. Now, that's a hard thing to manage because it stops being true after about nine months, and then by the time you're dealing with a man, it's almost never true. <laughs> so, or he's not a man. So, what that implies is that women will attend to what's wrong first. They'll become aware of it first. And they'll become aware of it emotionally, and they'll attempt to communicate that. Now, that proclivity, powerful as it is, has a corresponding temptation. Just like the proclivity of men to sort and order has a corresponding temptation. The temptation that men fall prey to is to make the claim either that everything has already been sorted and ordered, thank you very much, which is the claim of the tyrant, or that no matter what you bring me, I can sort and order it. Right. So what does Eve do? She harkens to the voice of the snake. Good. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast in the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, and God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, right, central place, right? So this is the core. It's the core. It's the center. It's the foundation. That's all. That's what that all points toward. God's injunction to human beings is that you are not to touch what's at the center. You're to leave the implicit moral order of the cosmos he attacked, you're to abide by that. You're not going to, you're not to take yourself, you're not to take to yourself the right to defy the domain of value itself. But the snake says, you shall not surely die, for God knows that in the day you meet thereof, then your eyes will be opened and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Well, that sounds pretty tempting, but one of the things you might ask yourself is, what happened to you the last time I went? <coughs> Your eyes were open, and you knew good and evil. And that's what happens when you, let's say, you realize that someone you trusted betrayed you. It might be you, but it's very often the case that an increment in wisdom is something that produces quite the cataclysmic fall. It's also the case, and this is, where the metaphor here is particularly apt. What's the central sin of pride? So first of all, we know that in the biblical tradition, there's virtually no worse sin than pride. Pride is the fundamental attribute of Lucifer, who is the spirit behind the snake, so to speak, who foments eternal rebellion in heaven and attempts to occupy the highest position. That's pride. It's no different than the temptation offered by the snake to Eve and Adam to set their own moral order above that that's implicit in the world. That's how those ideas are linked together. You shall not shut and die. You shall be as gods doing good and evil. What's the metaphor here? How often do you fail when you bite off more than you can shoot? Right, that's the eternal sin of pride. So what's the female variant? I can open my weak arms up to everything. I ask how to pass you though I am. And you see this in its most perverse forms, I would say, in the forms that are making themselves manifest in the world now. It's a claim of pride. Hmm. Here's one. I love my son so much that even if he decides he's my daughter, I'm so caring that that's all right. Yeah, you know, that's not all right. There isn't anything about that that's all right. There isn't anything that's possibly more destructive than that, especially when it's not done at all for the son, obviously, because just think what awaits him. It's done for the claim to moral superiority of the mother. 
And that's her pride in the waving of her false compassion like a flag. And if you don't think that by doing that, she's invited you to snakes, you are one of those people who's, what is it? There are none so blind as those who will not see. Right? That's that. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and the tree be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and also gave to her husband that he ate. I like the Dom Shabbat Eve. Sort of on the right. Bottom of the in my mind, it's like. And there's death lurking behind the tree in that particular image. Right. Well, pride goes before a fall. That's what they say, you know, and this is the fall of man. And so here's a, and maybe I'll close with this. Here's a, here's something to think about for the rest of your life. <laughs> there's an idea that's deep in the Christian ethos that death entered the world with the fall. And that's a very difficult concept to wrap your head around because death appears to be an end of part of life, everything dies. So what's the relationship between death and sin? Did suffer. Well, the first question you might ask yourself is, how much do you suffer because of pride? How much do you suffer because you bit off more than you could chew? How much do you suffer because you claim to be able to do things that you can't do falsely to elevate your moral status? How much do you suffer because you extend the realm of compassion around you farther than you're capable of managing so that you can parade that in front of others? How much do we all suffer because we tribute to ourselves more than we have the right to. And how deep does that go? I mean, we know per you know perfectly well that much of what makes you stumble and fall in the world is a consequence of your own blindness and pride. And then you might ask, well, to what degree is that universally the case? If you were playing the game optimally, if you cease to act in a prideful manner, if you approach the world in a truthful, and humble, humble way, and you were satisfied with what came your way, and you made the most of it with no false pretenses, how good could you make things around you? You, you can answer that the reverse, because you know perfectly well how miserable and, and deadly you can make things around you while walking the opposite path. How much of the suffering that characterizes, this is the real question of conscience for people who are apt to shake your fist at God. How much of the suffering that hypothetically characterizes the world, how much of the suffering in the world that we use as evidence for the justification of our nihilism and faithlessness is actually a consequence of the misery that we bring upon ourselves because we are arrogant and prideful and refuse to see and learn? And that's a question. That's a question. That's a question for prayer. And I, I would say that, I would say that, in the most literal sense, in some ways stripped of its theological implications. The next time you're miserable and frustrated and angry and resentful and bitter and prone to shake your fist at the sky, you could sit and ask yourself, are there any errors in what I've done or in the way that I'm looking at this situation that is making it at least far more hellish than it might have to be. And I would say that the inevitable consequence of asking that question in a genuine manner is that you will receive an answer that indicates exactly what it is that you did and are doing wrong that you could stop doing. And that's another one of those realizations that might come as quite a shock because 
It's a terrible thing to realize that you're the author of your own misery, but it's a lovely thing to be able to figure out if you can manage it, because if you're just being toyed with like a mouse is being toyed with a cat, that if, like a mouse is being toyed with by a cat, then you have no more hope than the mouse, but if you're the cat, well, then you could stop toying with yourself, and God only knows how much of the misery that you think is a consequence of the structure of the world might be revealed as the inevitable result of your presumption and arrogance. Presumption, arrogance, and willful blindness. And that's part of the purpose of confession and atonement, fundamentally. And there isn't a more optimistic idea than that, despite its horror. Because if you could find in your suffering the cause you bring to it, God only knows how much of that you could ameliorate. And the insistence in the Christian tradition is that if you rejected the, if you rejected the fruit that was evil and inedible, and you maintain your faith and walk with God in the garden, your suffering would cease, and the world would transform itself into paradise. And that's ultimately true. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.